Welcome, everybody, to today's virtual workshop on the FSB's holistic review report. Uh, my name is Matteo Aquilina, and I am a member of the FSB Secretariat here in Basel. Uh, the workshop will last for one hour. It will be recorded and posted on the FSB website at www.fsb.org. To get us started, the FSB Secretary General Dietrich Domanski will present the main findings and conclusions of the FSB report. We will then open the floor for Q&A. So this is a good opportunity for those of you on the call to send us questions on the holistic review. When we get to questions, please raise your virtual hand. You should see an icon on the right hand side of your screen. After I call your name, please wait for a few seconds so we can unmute you and then ask your question. If you prefer, you can use the chat function to send me a message and I will read your question to Dietrich. Thank you very much. I will now hand, down, hand the call to Dietrich. Thank you very much, Matteo, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you today from Basel. Welcome to today's webinar on the FSB's Holistic Review Report. I'm happy to present the report that we published and submitted to the G20 leaders last month. I will briefly go through the main findings of the report, the lessons and the policy implications. We should then have plenty of time for Q&A um, after my, my presentation. So let me start with a quick word on the why and the how. The COVID-19 shock in March tested the resilience of the global financial system. Some parts of the system, particularly banks and financial market infrastructures, were able to absorb rather than amplify the macroeconomic shock, in part due to the reforms adopted in the aftermath of the 2008-09 financial crisis. But key funding markets experienced acute stress and public authorities, especially central banks, had to take a wide range of extraordinary measures to support the supply of credit to the real economy. Absent such intervention, stress would have worsened significantly, so it is important to draw lessons from what happened. Against this backdrop, the holistic review examines the drivers, effects and implications of the market turmoil in March. The report draw, draws on analysis by the FSB standard setting bodies, particularly our IOSCO and our member authorities, input from external stakeholders and a review of the wider literature. As noted on, on the slide in front of you, the report provides an overview of key developments in global financial markets in March. It puts the market turmoil into context by describing the nature of the COVID-19 shock and the global economic and financial backdrop to the stress. The report then analyzes how the shock was transmitted through the global financial system and reviews policy measures taken to ease the financial market strain and their outcomes. Finally, the report concludes by identifying lessons, drawing policy implications and describing areas um, of further analysis and policy work. The report presents the shared understanding of the FSB membership about what happened and what needs to be done. Turning to the next slide, please. The events in March have to be seen in the context of global economic and financial developments prior to the pandemic. And uh, the, the uh, graph on this uh, slide illustrates uh, two of them. One is uh, that easy financing conditions in recent years led to a search for yield by investors and um, higher indebtedness by non-financial corporates, households, and governments globally. This is uh, uh, visible on the, uh, the right-hand panel of the graph. Um, these trends included rising cross-border lending and portfolio flows to emerging market economies, including a greater reliance on dollar-denominated borrowing by firms in those countries. Next slide, please. The second point is that the COVID-19 shock hit a global financial system that uh, have fundamentally changed over the past decade. The G20 regulatory reforms and market-driven adjustments in the aftermath of the 2008 or 9 financial crisis resulted in the growth of non-bank financial intermediation, or in brief, NBFI. Non-bank financial entities um, now hold almost half of global financial assets compared to 42% in, in 2008. At the same time, the international dollar funding landscape has evolved. 
including a shift of global portfolios towards U.S. securities and cross-border U.S. dollar-denominated lending into emerging market economies. And then there have been changes in the functioning of financial markets that have affected liquidity provision and the speed of transmission of price changes. These structural changes have affected the resilience of the global financial system in a number of ways. One is that credit risk is increasingly being intermediated and held outside the banking sector. Another is that interconnectedness in the system has increased and has taken new forms in some areas. And um, as part of that, intermediation chains have become longer and um, often more complex. And uh, thirdly, liquidity has become more central to the funding and pricing of financial assets and by implication for financial resilience. So after this scene setting in terms of a quick look at uh, sort of conjunctural trends and structural changes, um, let's turn to the events in March. Next slide, please. The breadth and dynamics of the economic shock and related liquidity stress in March were unprecedented. We know that the COVID-19 pandemic and government containment measures led to a sudden sharp pullback in real economic activity. Given the size and scope of the shock, some degree of financial stress would be expected. And indeed, as in previous cases, the shock initially led to a fundamental repricing of risk and a heightened demand for safe assets by investors. What did make the turmoil different was the death for cash episode in mid-March. And this episode manifested itself in a number of ways. First, there was an extremely high demand for cash and near cash assets, not just to cover liquidity needs, but also for precautionary reasons. This resulted in the broad-based selling of financial assets, including even the safest and usually most liquid ones. Second, there was a very sharp tightening of financial conditions, limiting the ability of non-financial corporates to obtain market funding. Third, pricing patterns across different markets began to break down, including in, in, uh, in, in core government bond markets, including the US Treasury market. Both equity and government prices declined over this short dash for cash period, with unusually large differences emerging between the price of assets that usually move in, in close sync on the run of the run bonds, um, uh, net asset value of a number of ETFs and the intraday price and the prices of treasury bonds and their future contracts. And finally, severe strains in offshore dollar funding markets emerged. The US dollar appreciated considerably as non-US corporates were unable to roll over funding and sold their dollar denominated assets. The strain was particularly severe in emerging market economies, forcing some non-US central banks to liquidate part of their foreign exchange reserves in order to accommodate the demand for dollars in their jurisdiction. Overall, this stress led to large and persistent imbalances in the demand for and supply of liquidity needed to support financial intermediation. On the demand side, non-financial corporates attempted to tap capital markets. Demand for US dollar liquidity increased from foreign borrowers non-government money market funds experienced significant outflows, and some open-ended funds also experienced redemptions. On the supply side, reductions in risk appetite, regulatory constraints, and operational challenges may have reduced dealers' capacity to intermediate larger flows in some core funding markets. Next slide, please. The holistic review identifies particular activities and mechanisms in the financial system that acted as mitigants or propagators of, of the liquidity stress. And these are shown on, on, on slide six. Um, central counterparties remained resilient despite the market turbulence, but margin calls may have been larger than expected in some cases, challenging liquidity risk management for some market participants and adding to the overall demand for, for cash. Non-government money market funds experienced significant outflows. Similar dynamics, also less intense and, and uh, widespread, were observed in certain types of open-ended funds. Some investors may have faced incentives to redeem ahead of others. While stronger bank capital and liquidity positions helped to prevent a sharp rise in counterparty risk, banks may have been unwilling to deploy substantial amounts of balance sheet capacity in an uncertain and volatile environment. Um, 
and last but not least, market dysfunction was exacerbated by substantial sales of U.S. treasuries by some leveraged non-bank investors and foreign holders. This led to a self-reinforcing loop. Next slide, please. So in addition to these um, specific factors, the turmoil also highlighted the increased importance of interconnectedness for understanding the resilience of the financial system. I apologize that uh, the presentation of this graph is not particularly clear, and I would ask you to look at the, the, the report where it is clear indeed. Um, the point that this um, map is, is going to make is that the interaction of a number of different market activities and mechanisms um, uh, may have propagated liquidity stress. Um, and the fact that there was no single trigger underscores the importance of analyzing the NBFI sector from a systemic perspective and understands its linkages um, uh, within the NBFI sector, but also with the banking sector. And, and the, the, the mapping of interconnections that you see on this slide um, uh, shows these interconnections in a stylized way. And in particular, it illustrates how the reversal and disruption of discretionary flows of cash propagated stress through the system. Now, turning to the policy response, this is the next slide. Um, this policy response was speedy, sizable, and, and sweeping. And um, as you can see on this slide, the expansion of central bank balance sheets, central bank assets uh, during uh, the, the, the dash for cash episode was, was, was larger than in, in after the collapse of, of Lehman. Um, so the unprecedented policy actions by central banks alleviated market stress through different channels, asset purchases, liquidity operations, uh, particularly for US dollars, and uh, backstop facilities providing targeted liquidity to specific financial entities. So regulatory and supervisory measures, as well as fiscal policies, complemented these central bank interventions. And the policies succeeded in alleviating market strains to date, with announce announcement effects appearing to be particularly important in restoring confidence and shaping the expectations of, of market participants. This policy response was and is no substitute for addressing the vulnerabilities that became apparent. Um, first, the need for central banks to intervene in such a substantial way could lead to moral hazard issues in the future if market participants do not fully internalize their own liquidity risk in times of stress. And second, the exceptional measures taken by central banks were not aimed at addressing the vulnerabilities that amplified the stress. So the underlying structures and mechanisms that gave rise to the turmoil are still in place. So against this backdrop, um, let me conclude with a few words on the FSB's NBFI work program, which is the next slide. So the work program uh, laid out on this slide um, comprehensive work program builds on the lessons from the holistic review. Its overarching objective is to enhance the resilience of the NBFI sector while preserving its benefits. In particular, the holistic review emphasizes that efforts to enhance NBFI resilience should not compromise the resilience of other parts of the financial system or the important role that NBFI plays in financing the real economy. The work and the work plan will be carried out within the FSB as well by its member standard setting bodies and international organizations. There is a strong consensus and a commitment across the FSB to take forward the NBFI work program, which was also endorsed by G20 leaders in November. Now, the work program focuses on three main areas. In the short term, that means to be completed largely over the next year, um, work focuses on specific issues that contributed to the amplification of the shock. This involves policy work to enhance money market fund resilience, as well as analytical work on liquidity risk and its management in open-ended funds. On frameworks and dynamics in margin calls in centrally cleared and uncleared derivatives markets, um, and the preparedness of market participants to meet those calls, and on the structure and liquidity provision in core bond markets, 
including the role of leveraged investors and factors that may have limited dealer capacity to intermediate. The second strand of work is um, focusing on enhancing our understanding of systemic risks in NBFI and the financial system as a whole. And this includes deepening the analysis of interconnectedness within NBFI, as well as between banks and non-banks, and examining um, the interaction of US dollar funding pressures and fund outflows in emerging market economies. And thirdly, um, work is going to assess policies uh, to address systemic risks in NBFI, and this involves examining the adequacy of current policy tools in the sector, the concept and desired level of resilience in NBFI, and the extent to which initiatives under this work program deliver that resilience. Let me stop here. This completes my presentation, and um, I would be happy to take questions from the audience. Matteo, back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Dietrich. Uh, we will now open the floor for questions. A gentle reminder to raise your virtual hand. I can already see a few there. And when I call your name, please wait a few seconds so we can unmute you. And after you ask the question, I would be grateful if you could please lower your hand. Uh, you can also use the chat function and send me a question. Uh, I am Matteo Aquilina, in case you've joined later. And please keep questions brief uh, so we can get through as many as possible. We will start with, let's see, uh, Andy Hill from ICMA. Um, thank you, uh, and thank you, uh, Dietrich, for, for a, a very interesting presentation. I think you may have answered this question partly already, but, um, but I, I think it's a point worth exploring. Do you feel that the that the events of March and April highlight that the structure of secondary bond markets is inherently different to that of equities or, or more other more more liquid asset classes? And to what extent do you think these differences should be better reflected in in both prudential and market regulation? We'll take a couple of more questions and then I'll ask Dietrich um, to respond. Uh, the second question I will ask uh, Tim Clausen from HSBC, uh, who I think is the um, uh, username uh, Observer HSBC. Tim, you're good to go. H hello. Yes, thank you so much. Um, uh, my, my question was just about, uh, about how much is in this for, for, for GZIBs to a certain extent, because in theory, I can see there's a lot uh, for us and our counterparties. But when I look at the momentum behind the FSB agenda, and then I compare that to the DHOT statement in November, um, you know, late last month, um, I guess it just seems to be a bit of a difference in sort of momentum of where this is going. And so just be interested in your reflections on that. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. I'll take one more question and then I'll uh, turn over to Dietrich. Let's ask um, Itai Katz, please. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. Domanski, for your uh, insightful um, presentation. Uh, my question is uh, a, a pertinent and specific one, uh, and it is uh, uh, whether there are any plans to disincentivize excessive leverage in corporate debt markets, uh, including in particular commercial real estate, uh, and whether through restrictions placed on banks or other non-bank financial intermediaries, uh, as there appears to be considerable risky credit wall developing. Thank you. Uh, Dietrich, uh, over to you. Thank you, Matteo, and thanks for this um, initial set of questions. Um, let, let me let me take them in, in order and starting with with, with Andrew um, about um, differences in the structure of, of um, uh, markets for different types of assets and and I think yes um, I, I think one of one of the lessons um, from from what we seen in March reinforcing I think what we what we knew before is that that the structure of secondary uh, 
bond markets is different from that for equities and a number uh, of other assets for a couple of reasons, some historical, some sort of, if you like, intrinsic to the features of the securities that are traded in terms of standardization, et cetera, um, but also market practices and, 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 and market infrastructures. Um, so um, then a question, well, what does that mean for, um, for, for prudential measures, um, uh, regulation, and the way authorities look at these differences? I think um, key differences between stocks and bonds and other assets um, are already reflected in regulation, for instance, in the way they are treated when assessing liquidity or, or riskiness of exposures. Um, now, um, a, a related question is, well, what, what about these differences in, in, I think, what you put as a structure of these markets? I think this is a question that, um, if you look at our work program, um, we may get to in the context of um, looking at the nature of systemic risk and, again, specifically in the context of, of interconnections and, and, and the question of, well, to what extent um, do different um, um, structures in these markets affect the way um, um, shocks, um, price developments, price changes, repricing of risks is, is transmitted across markets and across across entities. Um, so, and um, uh, this work is just just starting, as I mentioned before, um, and we have to see what comes out of it. But I think these these um, the results of this this work may uh, going forward influence the considerations of, of policymakers. Um, turning to Tim, um, the question: Well, what uh, what does all this mean for for banks or, or, or GSIPs? Um, well, again, I think the 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 key word here is is interconnections. And while while um, most of the work uh, following the holistic review focuses on NBFI. Um, there are interconnections with the, with the banking sector, and these sort of may um, come up in a in a, in, a, in a number of, of contexts. Uh, one is um, the, the the work on on, on margins, um, where, as I mentioned, there were questions as to whether um, uh, uh, the liquidity management of some clearing members uh, sort of was surprised by or had to deal with unexpectedly large margin calls and questions where, where this was coming from. Is there insufficient transparency, for instance, around um, around margining practices? Um, so that is one interface which, which has to do with the interconnections between banks and, and, and BFI. Um, another one is um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the question around dealer capacity and willingness to, to intermediate. Um, which uh, will be part of the, the uh, analytical work on, on bond market resilience. So um, my bottom line in response to your question is that, well, while NBFI is at the center, it is important to think, um, uh, especially when you, when you consider systemic risk, um, also in terms of the relevance of different forms of, of interconnections. Um, Ita's question on... Um, Leverage. Well, um, high corporate, non-financial corporate leverage was actually uh, one focus of FSB work um, one year ago. Uh, prior to the pandemic, we published a report on uh, leveraged loan and, and CLO markets. And um, the, the pandemic has, um, as shown in one of the graphs, uh, exacerbated the issue of um, how to um, make of in terms of um, risk assessments and policy responses, what to make of rising debt levels um, and, 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 and how to, to deal with them. Um, I think there, there are a couple of issues. I mean, there are, there are sort of near-term issues that, that concern um, um, supervisors and regulators, how to deal with these debt levels, what do they mean for, for debt sustainability, debt quality, um, 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 credit risk in, 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 in loan portfolios. Um, but there are also longer term issues that have to do with questions around um, insolvency re regimes, how to avoid uh, zombification of, uh, of, of, of corporates. Um, and, and fundamentally, um, an, an issue that is not 
of the FSB's work, but fundamentally the question about incentives for financing uh, through the issuance of debt uh, as opposed to, uh, uh, to, to equity. So th th these, are, these are big issues, I think, that, 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 that will form an important part of the policy agenda, not necessarily the FSB, but more generally the policy agenda going forward. And in the meantime, it will obviously, in light of the rapid increase in, in indebtedness, um, be important to monitor um, uh, corporate debt-related developments and, and assess vulnerabilities there on an, on an ongoing basis. Matteo, do you have further questions? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Dietrich. I'll call now um, Peter Grant, please. Hi there, thank you. Um, I have a question about the, the repo markets and uh, I'm wondering if there are any ideas to improve the resiliency of the markets, <clears throat> perhaps other than uh, central clearing um, uh, or failing uh, ideas for improving the resiliency of the market. Are there any thoughts about approaches for reducing the reliance on such short-term funding markets? Let me take one, one more question from um, Michael Pedroni, please. So my question, uh, thank you for doing this, uh, very helpful. My question is on the uh, work program, um, both the timeline that you anticipate for the work program, and, and I saw what you had in the report, but I wonder if you can elaborate maybe a little bit more on the timeline for each of these items and uh, how they will be uh, taken forward, you know, it, it, under which uh, committees and so forth. Thank you. And I will add one of the questions I received um, through the chat, um, which is, uh, what was the role of hedge fund in the crisis? Uh, Dietrich, over to you. Thank you, Matteo. Um, starting with with with, with Peter, um, and I, I think that the question that we are we are we are dealing with here, if I may sort of paraphrase what you, what you said, is is well, um, why why did the intense selling pressure um, overwhelm the sort of capacity of some financial institutions to to intermediate in in, in certain markets and 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 how, how to deal with that? Uh, situation. I think that's an important question, and and uh, because it gets to the heart of the the, the issue of well, um, how, how do we think of the capacity of the financial system to um, to to handle uh, liquidity imbalances during stress? And um, I think looking at the work program, the the, the work on uh, liquidity structure and resilience of core bond markets will get to this question. It will examine the structure and liquidity provision in core funding markets during stress, and that will include the role of leveraged investors and factors that, that limit uh, dealer capacity to, to intermediate. Um, and that last part of the answer is actually a segue into answering the other two questions. Let me take the, the third one first uh, that came through the chat, the role of, uh, the role of hedge funds. Um, I think that, uh, this is... As I just mentioned, this is one of, of the issues that requires uh, further consideration. We saw, uh, in terms of the, uh, um, the, 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 the stress in, in core government bond markets, and particularly the, the U.S. Treasury markets, a confluence of factors um, at work, sales uh, of treasuries on a large scale by entities abroad, um, uh, deleveraging of positions by, by leverage investors. So disentangling these factors and understanding their, their interaction, I think, is, is going to be an important part of the work. Now, um, on Michael's question uh, concerning the, the timing and, um, and, and concrete organization of, of work, um, so the, 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 the general approach is... Um, as, as I mentioned in my, my presentation, to um, prioritize and focus on, on the specific issues, including money market fund resilient, liquidity risk and its management in open-ended funds, margining practices, liquidity structure, and resilience of core bond markets, 
um, in the nearer term. And the nearer term means here in particular to, through, through 20, uh, 2021. Um, and then on a somewhat longer fuse, take up the sort of systemic risk dimension, including the question of which policy, um, uh, how to think about a, an, 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 a policy orientation that takes into account the systemic dimension uh, of, of risks in NBFI. Now, um, how will this work be, be taken forward? Um, I, I don't want to go through uh, through the whole list here and, and, and through all the details. Um, just a couple of points. Um, the work is 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 um, 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 uh, coordinated uh, within the FSB and uh, in close cooperation, of course, with our members and um, standard setters. And then the individual initiatives will be taken forward either by the relevant standard setters, a combination of standard setters and um, uh, uh, FSB groups, or also, in, in some cases, um, international organizations. Um, so that's sort of, if you like, the principle one, that um, work will be done by those who have the expertise and the, uh, the, the responsibility for the respective areas. Okay. Second principle is work will be taken forward with um, uh, uh, intensive outreach to the private sector. And uh, in that sense, you can see today's um, webinar as, a, as, a, a, as launching um, a, a, a marathon of, of discussions with, uh, with, with the private sector, with external stakeholders um, on, uh, on this work. Um, I leave it with that for the moment. Uh, thank you, Dietrich. I will uh, now take uh, a couple of the questions that have come through the, uh, the chat, and then I will chat. call a couple of the people who raised their hand. Um, uh, questions are a bit uh, wordy, but I think I, I can summarize them. And, and the first one is if you can tell us a bit more about the uh, money market fund work stream, uh, and we'll, if you have any policy measures in mind to add resilience to MMFs, um, and, and, and what, what uh, hypothesis, actually, what, what the policy uh, proposals uh, that you have without killing the product. And the second question along similar lines um, is on the work on bond markets and whether that's going to be uh, focused on the high yield curve or just the short end of the curve. Okay, um, on, on money market funds, um, so um, this this work is in, in, in the process of, of of being being launched, and um, uh, we've we've had um, uh, initial. There have been initial um, discussions, conversations around the range of um, um, uh, policy options that 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 could be considered. And um, uh, it, it's early days, so I don't want to go uh, in, in the direction of, of, of suggesting. Um, 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 what, uh, what what specific options might might actually be be uh, uh, be, be be considered more, more closely? But I, I think the idea is to um, uh, go go into the exercise with an with an open mind and look at um, if you like um, at, at measures that that may target if you like the asset side of, of money market funds, um, uh, asset composition, um, um, portfolio choices, um, asset risk management, um, as well as the liability side, um, and, and that uh, includes um, um, potentially questions around um, the effects of of, of, of um, uh, risk mit mitigants that that were used in in March, and then sort of another dimension could be. Um, um, measures that target, if you like, factors outside money market funds, asset and liabilities that may have to do with underlying funding markets, um, external support, disclosures, and so on and so forth. So these are broad directions in, 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 one, in which one, one can think. But um, as suggested by the question, I mean, um, one important first step is to be clear about the objective, right? I mean, we, we, are, we are talking here about um, an, 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 an instrument that, that has a little bit of a hybrid character in, in, in a number of cases that combines sort of cash-like elements, but at the same time um, uh, plays an important role in, in, uh, in providing short-term funding to non-financial corporates and, and also banks. And sort of what, what, what is the objective? 
um, with respect to those functions. I think this is a first question that, uh, that will be clarified. Um, bond markets, um, long end versus um, whole maturity range. Um, uh, again, we'll, we'll have to see. Um, my, um, my hunch would be that if, if you want to understand um, uh, uh, the, the, the liquidity provision and functioning and resilience of, of core bond markets, then it will be important, coming back to the point of interconnectedness, to, rel uh, to understand um, uh, relevant um, interconnections across um, or along the yield curve, um, um, for instance, through repo markets. Um, so in that sense, I personally have to see um, uh, how this work develops, but my personal um, expectation would be that um, this would not just only be about the long end, but would also span span other segments of the of the yield curve. Uh, thank you very much, Dietrich. I will now ask um, Tomihiro Tedanishi to ask his question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, so my question is that um, so. Uh, the, the banks and insurance sector that went through regulatory reform to date took a safety identifying approach to, for the financial stability perspective. And that somewhat proved uh, the resilience side of this March uh, turmoil. Um, so, uh, and from the report in this NBFI work program, um, it seems that you would like to address by capturing entire ecosystem of this um, NBFI rather than identifying major uh, players. And do, do you consider that taking a di different approach this time is better? Uh, thank you very much. Um, next one is uh, Tomo Ishikawa. Hello, uh, thank you. Um, I want to ask a question around uh, smart, smart turmoil and too big to fail, how they kind of interconnect. Um, you know, you know this more than I do, but the FSB published a report on too big to fail and where the analysis showed that banks deleveraged due to tighter regulations, but NBFI pick up the slack. I think that was the, the phrase you use. And the fact that the banks reduced the asset may have increased the interconnectedness. So the question I had was, uh, how do you square the circle here that uh, you know, what happened in March versus the increase in size of the NBFIs due to the too big to fail reform. Do you think, uh, do you expect NBFIs to shrink given the systemic implications uh, once you go through the reform or do you think you'll be focusing more on resilience, not necessarily the size of NBFI? Thank you. Did you, do you want to take these two questions together? Yeah, yeah these, these, are, these are interesting questions and I think they, um, they they go to the um, uh, the, the heart of um, the, the 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 structural changes that we have seen over the past decade. This this shift um, towards um, non bank financial intermediation that 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 we describe in uh, I think it's chapter two of of, of the holistic review, um, and. Uh, I think it's important to start from a clear recognition that um, this this um, uh, shift towards uh, non-bank financial intermediation reflects much more than a an, a, a reaction to to regulatory reforms, uh, more stringent bank regulation, including too big to fail regulation. I would not sort of pinpoint too much or focus too much on that. That's just one part of of a, of a broader broader reform package that, by the way, also included to some extent NBFI already. Um, um, and uh, But I, I, it's important to see the, the, the growth of NBFI um, as, as um, um, reflecting also um, a, 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 a diversification in um, the way um, finance is provided to the real economy, both on the side of uh, the receivers of finance, borrowers, others, but also on the side of um, of savers and private households and the opportunities, the different mechanisms that are available to them um, to um, invest their savings um, in, in in diversified portfolios. 
So um, I think the bottom the bottom line of this is that any any sort of policy considerations uh, needs to be mindful of um, striking the right balance, um, uh, aiming at enhancing resilience while preserving um, the benefits of, of non-bank financial intermediation. So in that respect, I think that um, uh, talking about, well, um, uh, is the objective to, to, to reduce the, 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 the size of NBFI? I, 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 I'm not sure that this, this is the way I would put the question. No. Um, um, again, I, I, I prefer to talk about uh, the objectives, which again is to make sure that we understand um, the, the behavior and resilience of this um, growing part of the global financial system, that we understand it properly and make sure that uh, we have um, the necessary resilience. Um, then uh, the, the second question, um, I think that came from uh, uh, Tommy Hero was, was about, um, was that about um, um, the role of, of individual entities. Um, I, I think it's, it goes back to the same point about the, the, the structural changes that we have seen in the global financial system. And, and how these changes have, what we've learned about um, the behavior of these um, um, structures in, in March. And here I would say that um, as, as discussed in the holistic review, um, that financial stability risks posed by NBFI, um, I would say seem to be in, in, in many cases, at least the result of a combination of, of, of weaknesses, vulnerabilities in particular types of structures of NBFI. Um, we talked about uh, specific forms, non-government money market funds before, that may be one example. So specific types of, of um, intermediation structures in, in non-banks um, and certain activities. So it's the, it's the combination of, 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 of um, uh, structures, entities and, and, and activities. And um, then there is the interaction of, of um, the two through close interconnections that may then lead to systemic stress. And I think if you take all this together, what this suggests is essentially to do what we are planning to do in our second strand of work, to have a, 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 a careful um, look at um, how to think about and what to make of systemic risk in the, in the NBFI, NBFI sector. Um, where this will lead to in terms of policy implications, emphasis on entities versus versus activities um, and how to bring in interconnectedness. I think this is um, an important question, but one that is um, too early to try to give an answer to at this stage. Thank you, Dietrich. Uh, let me take a couple more questions. Uh, the first one from uh, Uni Altonen. Hello, thank you. Um, thank you, Dietrich, for organizing this interaction. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. My question is, if the is the analysis on dealer capacity going to also address the incentives created by regulation? And if the balance between regulated and non-regulated, probably what I would call daylight intermediation, has moved too far towards entities um, that do not necessarily have the same commitment to provide market liquidity and risk warehousing capacity as the uh, banks do. Thank you. And I will uh, take another question from uh, Richard Portis as well. To please. Sorry, am I, am I now? I can hear you now. Very good. Thank you. The March events took place in an environment of exceptionally low interest rates. Uh, to what extent might that have contributed to market fragility? And if you judge that significant, will there be any consideration in your review of mitigating measures, assuming rates do remain low for the foreseeable future? Do you want to take these two questions? Sure, Th thanks for these questions. Um, so on, on high frequency traders, um, uh, again, one, one area, one development that is potentially important. Um, I, um, uh, it, it hasn't featured particularly prominently 
um, in the in the discussions uh, 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 during the preparation of, of of the holistic review. So I'm, I'm um, not in a position to say much about this now. Um, however, I would not rule out that it, it, uh, the issue will come up, um, especially in the context uh, of the work on uh, on, on uh, core bond market resilience. Um, on on uh, Richard Porter's question about um, well the, the the role of the current uh, or the, the the low interest rate environment is maybe not just the current environment but the, the lower for longer interest rate environment um, in influencing um, market market uh, behavior, market performance, risk taking, and uh, eventually fragilities. Um, well, um, we, we have been we have been monitoring uh, vulnerabilities in the financial system against the backdrop of a continued um, search for yield for for quite some some time, and have have warned against. Um, the, the 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 potential risks associated with that um, in terms of an underpricing of of uh, risks on the on, on the credit side, um, but also in terms of of um, an underappreciation of uh, potential um, potential liquidity risks. Um, so um, uh, while the, the the report does not um, make make a firm statement about the role that that uh, the search for yield environment uh, did play in March. Uh, in March, but um, uh, I uh, I think it is an issue that that uh, will um, be part of the considerations going forward, uh, because in the end it will be important if there are any on the regulatory side. If there were to be taken any 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 steps, um, these steps um, uh, would have to be robust. Um, to, to changes in, in, in the interest rate um, environment. I would leave it, leave it with that. And uh, uh, again, this is something that is subject to, to exploration and discussion. Thank you, Dietrich.